Carl Pandram was an active criminal, even during his pre-teen years. He spent decades in and out of reform schools and prisons, and his attitude toward authority was dismal, as he built a reputation for attacking prison guards. It wasn't until just before his death that the extent of his crimes became available to us, and that was through his own writing. However, whether or not we can trust that information is debatable. He confessed to 21 murders, but was suspected of killing in excess of 100 people, yet only five of them were confirmed. Carl was actually born Charles Pandrum on the 28th of June 1891 in East Grand Forks, Minnesota, growing up on a farm as a member of a large family consisting of seven siblings. At the tender age of five or six, he'd already started stealing and was becoming a handful for his parents. Punishments in the family home were rather harsh. The children were often chained or starved. However, by the time he turned eight, his father walked out on them and never returned. Around that period, Carl was arrested for the first time for being drunk and disorderly, which is hard to imagine for such a young age. The scariest part about this young boy is that he developed into a man with a deep-seated hatred against humanity, including a desire for the human race to be wiped out. How did this happen? And why did he hate everyone? I guess by looking into his life and the hideous crimes he went on to commit can help us to draw our own opinion. Hi there, my friend. I'm Royston, and welcome back to the channel. It's interesting because Carl himself had thought about, had thought about his life and had his own idea regarding why he ended up being so devoid of human feelings. And I think it's time for us to take a look at how all of this transpired. And we can do that by getting ready for some tea and crime. After being arrested at the age of eight for being drunk and disorderly, that experience didn't curb his appetite to pursue a criminal path. In 1903, at the age of 11, he was arrested again for being drunk. And shortly after this arrest, he stole some food alongside a revolver from a neighbor's house. His mother was finding him too difficult to manage, and as a result, she sent him to the Minnesota State Training School. The school was a juvenile detention facility designed to reform young offenders, where he stayed from the ages of 11 to 13. Unfortunately, while he was there, he was beaten, tortured, and repeatedly essayed by staff members. This was despite it being enveloped by Christianity. Yet if anyone misbehaved in some way, the staff would severely punish them. Carl had difficulty reading due to a lack of education, and this was the main reason he was constantly taken to what was known as the painting room. The painting room was where youngsters were often taken to be literally beaten up. And by the time they exited the room, they'd be covered in bruises of all different colours, just like the colours of paint, hence its nickname. After a while, he became resentful toward both authority and religion. Let's not forget he was under a Christian training programme and not long before his release, he found great pleasure in burning the painting room down. By late 1905, he learned how to tickle the ears of the staff by telling them what they wanted to hear. When appearing before the parole board, he convinced them that he'd changed and was now fully reformed as a result of the lessons the school taught him. However, behind their back, his real thoughts about his time at Red Wing were revealed in his autobiography when he said, I was reformed all right. I've been taught by Christians how to be a hypocrite, and I learned more about stealing, lying, hating, burning and killing. After being paroled, his mother collected him from the school, but his resentment toward her was brewing. When she was the one who sent him there, and prior to that, had subjected him to severe punishments. He admitted later in life that he literally hated his mum. The following year in 1906, he'd had enough of farm life and decided to leave. 
and he did that by boarding a freight train at the age of 14. And like his father, he never went back to his mother. Instead, he travelled across America committing burglaries, stealing and consuming alcohol to the point of becoming a heavy drinker. One day while on a train, he was approached by four men who offered him some decent clothing and a place to sleep. However, it wasn't free. They expected a favour in return. And before the 14-year-old knew what was happening, the men completely overpowered him, taking turns to S.A. Carl. Chillingly, he wrote about that terrible experience. I left that box a sadder, sicker, but wiser boy. I made up my mind that I would rob, burn, destroy, and kill everywhere I went and everybody I could, as long as I lived. He then went on to be arrested in Montana for burglary, receiving a one-year sentence in the Montana State Reform School. Although he was only 14, he had the physique of a full-grown man, weighing close to 200 pounds, plus he was six foot tall. One of the staff members there treated Carl disrespectfully to the point that he just couldn't take it anymore, resulting in a vicious retaliation. Carl beat the man senseless, but as a consequence, a number of guards returned the favour with interest. It's not hard to understand that Carl was a violent individual, but at the same time, he was also the victim of violence. He eventually found a way to escape the reform school with another inmate named Jimmy Benson. Between them, they manoeuvred a path that incorporated a string of robberies, including stealing guns and committing arson throughout the Midwest. Carl's preferred targets were churches, as they held a significance due to his inhumane treatment in that Christian detention facility in Minnesota. By now, his psychological development, like cognitive thinking, moral reasoning and personality traits were dead set against authority figures. After about a month on the road with his fellow outlaw, well, they decided to part company. And it's no surprise that Pandram became an alcoholic while still a teenager. And one night when he was sitting in a bar in Montana, he listened to an officer who was recruiting people to join the army. This led him to enlist. However, having no respect for authority led to a constant refusal to follow orders and he was always intoxicated. His insubordination, together with getting caught for stealing, made it clear he was impossible to control. It led to being court-martialed and sentenced to three years' imprisonment at the disciplinary barracks at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. He was consequently dishonorably discharged from the services, and this punishment was approved by the then Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, who shortly afterward became the 27th President. Regarding his experience at Leavenworth, Pantram uttered, I was a pretty rotten egg before I went there, but when I left there, all the good that may have been in me had been kicked and beaten out of me. He was released in 1910 at the age of 19 and had vengeance on his mind directed toward Howard Taft, the man who became president. At this point, he had nowhere to go. He didn't have a home, a family, and he didn't have any prospects. Most of his life had been spent in reform schools or prisons and the years of abuse and torture that he'd suffered twisted his mind. Over the next few years, he was arrested on many occasions for committing all types of crime. In addition to that, he used a lot of aliases to minimise detection. Then, in 1915, Pandren was sentenced to seven years at the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem. Once again, he'd been caught stealing. Life at Oregon State was tough, and it didn't help that the guys there took an immediate dislike to him. The warden was the infamous Harry Minto, who believed in providing harsh treatment to inmates, including beatings and isolation. Pandrum swore that he'd never do that seven years and defied the warden and his officers. Partly because of that, they beat him, hung him from rafters and placed him in solitary confinement. While in solitary, he mainly dined on cockroaches. However, during his first year at Oregon, he helped another inmate, a chap named Otto Hooker, to escape. And while escaping, 
Hooker killed the warden, Harry Minto. This made Pandrum, who was in his mid-twenties, an accessory to the crime. His first known involvement in murder. He was soon recaptured after escaping, but that didn't deter him from escaping again the following year by soaring through prison bars. However, throughout his many incarcerations, he was never a model prisoner. In fact, he became infamous for the many fights he had with correction officers. After his latest escape from Oregon, he then shaved his moustache off, boarded a train, and according to Carl, made his way to New York before travelling to over 30 countries, including Europe. When in Europe, he visited England, Glasgow, France and Germany, and of course continued his lifestyle as a criminal. However, by the summer of 1920, he was back in the States, making his way to New Haven, Connecticut, where he was dead set on revenge against William Taft, the man who approved of him being sent to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas 12 years previously, in 1908. This was the man who served as President of the United States from 1909 to 1913. Carl acted out his revenge when breaking into his home, stealing large amounts of bonds and jewellery plus a semi-automatic pistol, specifically a 45 caliber Colt 1911. With the money he gained from the crime, he bought himself a yacht, which he registered under the alias name of John O'Leary. He then hired a number of sailors he learned from bars to work on his boat while offering them alcohol with an ulterior motive as he was becoming more and more sinister. On 10 separate occasions, Carl allegedly shot the sailors with the president's stolen gun before throwing them overboard near Execution Rock's lighthouse on Long Island. The yacht was eventually lost due to a storm near Atlantic City. He then fled to the west coast of Africa, ending up in Luanda, Angola. And while there, he frightfully used a rock to smash against the head of an 11-year-old boy. A boy he'd just essayed. Yet he wasn't finished with him until shooting the youngster to ensure he was dead. He wrote about this murder when he said, His brains were coming out of his ears when I left him, and he will never be any deader. Also while in Africa, he hired six locals to help him with a crocodile hunting expedition. And when the crocodiles appeared, he shot all six of them, throwing their bodies to the hungry crocs, demonstrating the extent of his hate for people. By the summer of 1922, he was back in the States where he continued his hate. He came across two young boys beating one of them with a rock and strangling the other one. Both victims were essayed before he murdered them. In 1923, he tried to rob a train depot in Larchmont, New York, but was caught, resulting in a five-year prison sentence. His new home, the Clinton Correctional Facility, held a reputation for being one of the most brutal prisons. The prison guards were known to inflict abuse and outright torture to prisoners. Pandrum, in his typical way, made no effort to become a model prisoner and not long after arriving there he tried to firebomb the workshops additionally he attacked one of the guards in an attempt to kill him but failed he then made an effort to escape by jumping over a prison wall but landed on a concrete step the daring plan was unkind to him as his legs and ankles were broken and on top of that his spine was badly injured for some reason, he didn't receive any medical treatment for 14 agonizing months. Eventually, he was operated on, and once his body was feeling better, he raped a fellow inmate, which sent him back to a familiar environment in solitary. Although he found himself in constant pain in that cell, it gave him time to envision what he'd like to do. He entertained ideas about wiping out an entire city by poisoning its water supply with arsenic. Another thought he reflected on involved interfering with and sinking a British warship that was docked in New York with the intention of starting a war between the US and Britain. Anyway, he was released from prison in July 1928 and even though his injuries affected him, it didn't stop his criminal career. 
He burgled at every opportunity and murdered a man in Baltimore, Maryland. Carl was clearly a transient killer, as he never remained in one place for a significant amount of time. Then, on August 30th, 1928, Panton was arrested yet again in Baltimore for a burglary in Washington, D.C. He actually represented himself during his trial and admitted he wasn't only guilty for the burglary, but had stayed in the house hoping the owners would return so that he could murder them. Fortunately, they didn't show. During his interrogation, he confessed to killing three young boys earlier that same month in August, one in Salem, one in Connecticut, and a teenager in Philadelphia. Pandrum's confession to killing a boy at Pier 28 and what was formerly known as League Island near Philadelphia was confirmed. The authorities were unable to corroborate the other confessions, but they investigated the areas where the murders were carried out and began to identify Pandrum as a serial killer. And this time he was sentenced to 25 years. Ironically, he was returned to the Leavenworth Penitentiary, the one he especially hated. It was the same prison where he previously said that any good he may have been holding on to had been kicked and beaten out of him. However, his intention to kill anyone he could get his hands on wasn't over yet. When he arrived and was being reintroduced to the rules by the warden, Carl made a sinister remark by warning him with these words. I'll kill the first man that bothers me. Because of his psychotic nature, he wasn't allowed to mix with the general prison population. Therefore, he was assigned a job in the laundry, which allowed him to work alone. Unsurprisingly, it didn't take him long to keep his promise to the warden when he killed the laundry foreman by beating him to death with an iron bar. It was for this crime that Carl was sentenced to death by hanging. Despite measures taken by human rights activists to avert the sentence, Carl refused to appeal and lashed out death threats toward those who were trying to help. In his writings, he explained his view on this. I look forward to a seat in the electric chair or dance at the end of a rope, just like some folks do for their wedding night. The case of Mr. Pandrum, in my opinion, is a tragic one. He was determined to kill and destroy to the greatest extent possible. His anger was pure, without limit. He was completely out of control and shaped by violence, becoming the extreme version of those who committed crimes against him, which he then reflected against others. However, on death row, a kind-hearted guard named Henry Lesser felt sorry for him and gave Carl a dollar to buy something with, an unusual occurrence. Soon afterward, the two men became friends, which was almost unthinkable. Henry spent time with Carl, encouraging him to write his life story, even providing the instruments for him to do this. Pandrum hadn't really had a real friend and decided that writing about himself was doable. However, his writing spared no details about the disgusting things that he'd done, and it took just over a year to record. And this is a reason why we know so much about his criminal history, as a good chunk of it has been verified. If we take an extract from his writing, it will paint a picture regarding who he was. I am 36 years old, and I've been a criminal all of my life. I have 11 felony convictions against me. I have served 20 years of my life in jails, reform schools and prisons. I know why I am a criminal. Others may have different theories as to my life, but I have no theory about it. I know the facts. If any man ever was a habitual criminal, I am one. In my lifetime, I have broken every law that was ever made by both man and God. If either had made more, I should cheerfully have broken them also. The mere fact that I have done these things is quite sufficient for the average person. Very few people ever consider it worthwhile to wonder why I am what I am and do what I do. All that they think it is necessary to do is catch me, try me, convict me, and send me to prison for a few years, make life miserable for me while in prison, and then turn me loose again. This is a system that is in practice today in this country. Those who are sincere in their desire to put down crime 
had to be pitied for all of their efforts which accomplished so little in the desired direction. I have no desire whatsoever to reform myself. My only desire is to reform other people who try to reform me. And I believe that the only way to reform people is to kill them. Hurry up and bring on your electric chair. I want to leave here and take a nosediver to the next world, just to see if that one is as lousy as this ball of mud and meanness. I am sorry for only two things. These two things are, I am sorry that I have mistreated some few animals in my lifetime, and I am sorry that I am unable to murder the whole damn human race. I find it difficult to imagine anyone being as dangerous as Carl Pansrum. His whole life was a mess from the beginning to the end. And some people say that Carl was the most unpredictable killer among serial killers and possibly the most frightening of them all. When he was sentenced to death, it only took the jury a mere 45 minutes before delivering the guilty verdict. And then on the 5th of September 1930, at the age of 39, Correctional officers walked with Carl to the gallows. His execution was witnessed by a relatively small group, made up of a few newspaper journalists, a couple of US marshals, and a number of correction officers. As the marshals attempted to cover his head with a black hood, he took the opportunity to spit directly into the executioner's face. He also cursed his mother for bringing him into the world. The man who committed five confirmed murders, alongside 21 confessed killings, and suspected of murdering in excess of 100 people, was finally put to death. It'll be good to hear what you think about this case in the comment section down below. Well, I'm Royston, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.